Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Volume 2 Chapter 27 Wherein it is shown who Master Pedro and his ape were, together with the mishap Don Quixote had in the braying adventure, which he did not conclude as he would have liked or as he had expected. Full-size side Hamid, the chronicler of this great history, begins this chapter with these words. I swear as a Catholic Christian, with regard to which his translator says that side Hamid's swearing as a Catholic Christian, he being as no doubt he was a Moor, only meant that, just as a Catholic Christian taking an oath swears, or ought to swear, what is true, and tell the truth in what he avers, so he was telling the truth, as much as if he swore as a Catholic Christian, in all he chose to. Write about Quixote, especially in declaring who Master Pedro was and what was the divining ape that astonished all the villages with his divinations. He says, then, that he who has read the first part of this history will remember well enough the Guinness de Passamont whom, with other galley slaves, Don Quixote set free in the Sierra Morina, a kindness for which he afterwards got poor thanks and worse payment from that evil-minded, ill-conditioned set. This Guinness de Passamont Don Ginesillo de Parapilla, Don Quixote called him it was that stole Dapple from Sancho Panza, which— because by the fault of the printers either the how nor the when was stated in the first part, has been a puzzle to a good many people, who attribute to the bad memory of the author what was the error of the press. In fact, however, Guinness stole him while Sancho Panza was asleep on his back, adopting the plan and device that Brunello had recourse to when he stole Sacrapin's horse from between his legs at the siege of Albraca, and, as has been told, Sancho afterwards recovered him. This Guinness, then, afraid of being caught by the officers of justice, who were looking for him to punish him for his numberless rascalities and offenses, which were so many and so great that he himself wrote a big book giving an account of them, resolved to shift his quarters into the kingdom of Aragon, and cover up his left eye, and take up the trade of a puppet showman, for this, as well as juggling. He knew how to practice to perfection. From some released Christians returning from Barbary, it so happened, he bought the ape, which he taught to mount upon his shoulder on his making a certain sign, and to whisper, or seem to do so, in his ear. Thus prepared, before entering any village whither he was bound with his show and his ape, he used to inform himself at the nearest village, or from the most likely person he could find, as to what particular things had happened there, and to whom, and bearing them well in mind, the first thing he did was to exhibit his show, sometimes one story, sometimes another, but all lively, amusing, and familiar. As soon as the exhibition was over he brought forward the accomplishments of his ape, assuring the public that he divined all the past and the present, but as to the future he had no skill. For each question answered he asked two reals, and for some he made a reduction, just as he happened to feel the pulse of the questioners and when now and then he came to houses where things that he knew of had happened to the people living there, even if they did not ask him a question, not caring to pay for it, he would make the sign to the ape and then declare that it had said so and so, which fitted the case exactly. In this way he acquired a prodigious name and all ran after him. On other occasions, being very crafty, he would answer in such a way that the answers suited the questions and as no one cross-questioned him or pressed him to tell how his ape divined, he made fools of them all and filled his pouch. The instant he entered the inn he knew Don Quixote and Sancho, and with that knowledge it was easy for him to astonish them and all who were there. But it would have cost him dear had Don Quixote brought down his hand a little lower when he cut off King Marsilio's head and destroyed all his horsemen, as related in the preceding chapter. So much for Master Pedro and his ape, and now to return to Don Quixote of La Mancha. After he had left the inn he determined to visit, first of all, the banks of the Ebro and that neighborhood, before entering the city of Saragossa, for the ample time there was still to spare before the just left him enough for all. With this object in view he followed the road and traveled along it for two days, without meeting any adventure worth committing to riding until on the third day. As he was ascending a hill, he heard a great noise of drums, trumpets, and musket shots. At first he imagined some regiment of soldiers was passing that way, 
and to see them he spurred rock. I nanti and mounted the hill. On reaching the top he saw at the foot of it over two hundred men, as it seemed to him, armed with weapons of various sorts, lances, crossbows, partisans, halberds, and pikes, and a few muskets and a great many bucklers. He descended the slope and approached the band near enough to see distinctly the flags, make out the colors and distinguish the devices they bore, especially one on a standard or ensign of white satin, on which there was painted in a very lifelike style an ass like a little sard, with its head up, its mouth open and its tongue out, as if it were in the act and attitude of braying. And round it were inscribed in large characters these two lines they did not bray in vain, our alcaldes twain. From this device Don Quixote concluded that these people must be from the braying town, and he said so to Sancho, explaining to him what was written on the standard. At the same time be observed that the man who had told them about the matter was wrong in saying that the two who braid were regidors, for according to the lines of the standard they were alcaldes. To which Sancho replied, Senor, there's nothing to stick at in that, for maybe the regidors who braid then came to be alcaldes of their town afterwards, and so they may go by both titles. Moreover, it has nothing to do with the truth of the story whether the brayers were alcaldes or regidors, provided at any rate they did bray, for an alcalde is just as likely to bray as a regidor. They perceived, in short, clearly that the town which had been twit had turned out to do battle with some other that had jeered it more than was fair or neighborly. Don Quixote proceeded to join them, not a little to Sancho's uneasiness, for he never relished mixing himself up in expeditions of that sort. The members of the troop received him into the midst of them, taking him to be someone who was on their side. Don Quixote, putting up his visor, advanced with an easy bearing and demeanor to the standard with the ass, and all the chief men of the army gathered round him to look at him, staring at him with the usual amazement that everybody felt on seeing him for the first time. Don Quixote, seeing them examining him so attentively, and that none of them spoke to him or put any question to him, determined to take advantage of their silence. So, breaking his own, he lifted up his voice and said, Worthy sirs, I entreat you as earnestly as I can not to interrupt an argument I wish to address to you, until you find it displeases or wearies you, and if that come to pass, on the slightest hint you give me I will put a seal upon my lips and a gag upon my tongue. They all bade him say what he liked, for they would listen to him willingly. Full size with this permission Don Quixote went on to say, I, sirs, am a knight-errant whose calling is that of arms and whose profession is to protect those who require protection, and give help to such as stand in need of it. Some days ago I became acquainted with your misfortune and the cause which impels you to take up arms again and again to revenge yourselves upon your enemies, and having many times thought over your business in my mind, I find that, according to the laws of combat, you are mistaken in holding yourselves insulted, for a private individual cannot insult an entire community unless it be by defying it collectively as a traitor, because he cannot tell who in particular is guilty of the treason for, which he defies it. Of this we have an example in Don Diego Ordonez de Lara, who defied the whole town of Zamora, because he did not know that Valido Dolfos alone had committed the treachery of slaying his king, and therefore he defied them all, and the vengeance and the reply concerned all, though, to be sure, Senor Don Diego went rather too far, indeed very much beyond the limits of a defiance, for he had no occasion to defy the dead, or the waters, or the fishes, or those yet unborn, and all the rest of it as set forth. But let that pass, for when anger breaks out there's no father, governor, or bridle to check the tongue. The case being, then, that no one person can insult a kingdom, province, city, state or entire community, it is clear there is no reason for going out to avenge the defiance of such an insult, inasmuch as it is not one. A fine thing it would be if the people of the clock town were to be at loggerheads every moment with everyone who called them by that name, or the Casaleros, Berengeneros, Balanatos, Jabaneros, or the bearers of all the other names and titles that are always in the mouth of the boys and common people. 
It would be a nice business indeed if all these illustrious cities were to take huff and revenge themselves and go about perpetually making trombones of their swords in every petty quarrel. No, no, God forbid. There are four things for which sensible men and well-ordered states ought to take up arms, draw their swords, and risk their persons, lives, and properties. The first is to defend the Catholic faith, the second, to defend one's life, which is in accordance with natural and divine law, the third, in defense of one's honor, family, and property, the fourth, in the service of one's king in a just war, and if to these we choose to add a fifth, which may be included in the second, in defense of one's country. To these five, as it were capital causes, there may be added some others that may be just and reasonable, and make it a duty to take up arms, but to take them up for trifles and things to laugh at and be amused by rather than offended, looks as though he who did so was altogether wanting in common sense. Moreover, to take an unjust revenge, and there cannot be any just one, is directly opposed to the sacred law that we acknowledge, wherein we are commanded to do good to our enemies and to love them that hate us, a command which, though it seems somewhat difficult to obey, is only so to those who have in them less of God than of the world, and more of the flesh than of the Spirit. For Jesus Christ, God and true man, who never lied, and could not and cannot lie, said, as our lawgiver, that his yoke was easy and his burden light. He would not, therefore, have laid any command upon us that it was impossible to obey. Thus, sirs, you are bound to keep quiet by human and divine law. The devil take me, said Sancho to himself at this. But this master of mine is a theologian, or, if not faith, he's as like one as one egg is like another. Don Quixote stopped to take breath, and observing that silence was still preserved, had a mind to continue his discourse, and would have done so had not Sancho interposed with his smartness, for he, seeing his master pause, took the lead, saying, my lord Don Quixote of La Mancha, who once was called the Knight of the Rufo Countenance, but now is called the Knight of the Lions, is a gentleman of great discretion who knows Latin and his mother tongue like a bachelor, and in everything that. He deals with or advises proceeds like a good soldier, and has all the laws and ordinances of what they call combat at his fingers' ends, so you have nothing to do but to let yourselves be guided by what he says, and on my head be it if it is wrong. Besides which, you have been told that it is folly to take offense at merely hearing a bray. I remember when I was a boy I brayed as often as I had a fancy, without any one hindering me, and so elegantly and naturally that when I brayed all the asses in the town would bray. But I was none the less for that the son of my parents who were greatly respected, and though I was envied because of the gift by more than one of the high and mighty ones of the town, I did not care two farthings for it and that you may see I am telling the truth, wait a bit and listen, for this art, like swimming. Once learned is never forgotten. And then, taking hold of his nose, he began to bray so vigorously that all the valleys around rang again. One of those, however, that stood near him, fancying he was mocking them, lifted up a long staff he had in his hand and smote him such a blow with it that Sancho dropped helpless to the ground. Don Quixote, seeing him so roughly handled, attacked the man who had struck him lance in hand, but so many thrust themselves between them that he could not avenge him. Far from it, finding a shower of stones rained upon him, and crossbows and muskets unnumbered leveled at him, he wheeled Rocinante round and, as fast as his best gallop could take him, fled from the midst of them, commending himself to God with all his heart to deliver him out of this peril and dread every step of some ball coming in at his back and coming out at his breast, and every minute drawing his breath to see whether it had gone from him. The members of the band, however, were satisfied with seeing him take to flight, and did not fire on him. They put up Sancho, scarcely restored to his senses, on his ass, and let him go after his master, not that he was sufficiently in his wits to guide the beast, but Dapple followed the footsteps of Rocinante, from whom he could not remain a moment separated. Don Quixote, having got some way off, looked back, and seeing Sancho coming, waited for him, as he perceived that no one followed him. The men of the troop stood their ground till night, 
and as the enemy did not come out to battle, they returned to their town exulting, and had they been aware of the ancient custom of the Greeks, they would have erected a trophy on the spot. Full size, 